So um, I, I was, uh, I've been with Job Science for two years, run development QA, service delivery, product management, and then the care and feeding of Ted, uh, which for most of you, you know what that means. Um, and my screen just went away. There we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, 2005, I was nine years with, uh, with Salesforce.com. I was a customer for three years from 2000, a partner in 2001, a customer from 2002 to 2005, and then I worked for them from 2005 to 2014, and I had enough by that point. Uh, you know, 10 dream forces in a row, and, and it was time to move on. So um, I took two years to, spend, to waste a lot of the money that I'd made at Salesforce on a music startup. You know, and so there's a gap of two years, and, uh, and now I, had to, I, I needed a job after that, and I called up Ted and I said, Ted, what, what can I do? What can I do for you? So I've been here for two years. Uh, last week was my first, uh, my second anniversary, which was fun. Um, what does this have to do with AI? Um, uh, 50 years ago, uh, next year, a guy named Doug Engelbart did the best product demo ever, bar none. This was 1968. He demonstrated the mouse, high-speed networking, video conferencing, hypertext links. So Tim Bernard-Lee did not really invent hypertext. It was already invented in 68. Um, dynamic file linkages and shared whiteboard collaboration, basically go to meeting. Okay, that was 1968. And he did this with you know, some really primitive computing systems that were out there today. Um, 25 years later, fast forward 25 years later, everything that he demoed was no longer magic, it was practical to do. We had enough computing power to do it. 50 years after that demo, it's in our pocket, okay? So we, we kind of think about technology moving fast, but, but you gotta think in terms of what can happen after 25 to 50 years. And the reason I'm doing this in an AI talk is because if you look at um, the, the technologies that are being used in AI today, most of them were invented in the 70s. And some of them, Terry was talking about uh, correlation, some of the mathematical things that are being used in, 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 in machine learning were actually invented and discovered in the 60s, the 30s, I think. Yeah, Terry says the 30s. I wasn't around back then, so I don't know. So you hear the term AI thrown out a lot, and, and so when the marketing mavens are talking about AI, what does that really mean? Um, machine learning, it's really teaching a machine how to do the things, do things like recognize a number uh, or recognize an image, you know, recognize a cat. I have a video, I'm gonna give you a cat, and how do I, how do I let you recognize that? Uh, deep learning, and deep learning is a type of machine learning that's a lot more automated, and, and it uses neural networks, and it's an example of, the, of what the, the cat recognition thing, where Google and YouTube set it, set it thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of cat videos, and in the beginning, help them understand where's the cat and where's not the cat, right? But then after a while, it starts learning and it comes up with its own rules. One of the ch challenges with deep learning, and this was covered in the, in the uh, presentation yesterday, is it's a black box. You're not teaching the computer how to recognize a cat. So when the computer recognizes a cat, it can't tell you why it thinks that's a cat. So it's a black box. You have to trust, is it a cat? And in a lot of areas in AI, especially when you're dealing with, with areas that I'm gonna make a living off of, like can you recommend a candidate to me, until you have trust, you better be able to tell me why you're recommending this candidate. Not that just, hey, I'm, I'm the all-seeing Wizard of Oz and I'm gonna tell you that this is the right candidate for you, right? So pattern recognition, it's a type of uh, coral, uh, a machine learning that finds correlations and regular, regularities in data. Um, big data is not AI. Big data is simply processing data sets that are way too large and too complex for typical applications that are out there. Natural language processing, teaching a machine to understand our language, the way we speak. I had the privilege of working in 2001 when I was a partner of Salesforce, I was working at a company called Dejima that was a natural language processing company. Um, we crashed and burned a year after I joined. 
but the guy who was the, v, the director of engineering at that company went on to found Siri. And so he made a little bit of money out of that, and he also just sold his latest company to, um, to uh, Samsung or one of, the, one of those companies out there. Anyway, he's, he's made a lot in natural language processing. Natural language interface, using natural language to transact with a machine. So Siri, Alexa, Cortana, those are natural language interfaces. Now, one of the interesting things about this is, is when is it a good idea to use natural language interface and when not? And so hopefully this will work here. Hey Siri, set a timer for 45 minutes. Yeah, you didn't work on time. Say, hey Siri. Set a timer for 45 minutes. It's having a problem. I think the wireless is a little bit of a problem here. Anyway, the, this is an example of where, when it works, when I'm at home, if I'm cooking, I used to use the timer on the microwave because I could walk over to the microwave and say, give me three minutes and 30 seconds or give me four minutes or something like this. And now what I do is I take my phone and I put it on the counter and basically, while I'm cooking, I have my hands are dirty and all kinds of things. I can just talk to Siri, have her set a timer, and then it's done. And when I'm done, I can clean my hands and, and turn it off. But you know, the demo gods are not letting us do that today. Um, so natural language interface, but only when it's appropriate. You don't want to put that in place everywhere. And then semantic search, which basically is find me what I want, not just what I ask for, right? Um, one of the interesting things today is these companies, Salesforce, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and IBM, are not only, they, they are investing and have invested over the years huge amounts of money in AI. But if you haven't actually gone out and looked at, if, if you're a developer in this world today, you can go and find tools that have, you know, hundreds of man years worth of development already in them that are designed for you to just use as a tool. I saw um, at, at an Amazon, I've been in an Amazon event and a Google event, and this demo was done at both, where they started out from scratch, and they basically taught their Alexa or Siri equivalent how to recognize um, the conversation for booking a flight. So it started from scratch, said here's, here's how somebody's gonna ask for a reservation. A couple of different variations. Um, I'm going to put the flight number, the city in here, or I'm going to put the date in here, or the time in here. So they recognize these different things. And each one of these companies, um, probably Salesforce included, are going to have tool sets that let you build natural language user experiences. Things that in 2001, we were, we were spending you know, tons of resources to try to get something simple to be done. Um, and they're making them available as you know, uh, pieces of functionality that you can just rent. They're on the cloud. They're in the, they're in the cloud. If you want a natural language processor, great. If you want an image recognition processor, great. When we went to Amazon, they even said, do you want to use our library? Fine. Do you want to use Microsoft's library? Cool. Do you want to use IBM's library? Fine. So these companies are really in the business of, of making it possible to use incredible technology to solve business problems and letting the business systems, um, the subject matter experts in various, or in various industries solve those problems. So what is the value driver for us? We believe that AI should save you time so that you can network with people. So if you look in the staffing industry, the thing that, the thing that machines don't do and probably won't do for a while is to be able to understand the nuances of conversation, to be able to listen to somebody and go, yep, he's a geek, or no, this person is actually very uh, fluent, he would make a great salesperson, he's engaging. I mean, how can you, how can the machine, how can Siri tell me whether I'm engaging or not? You know, how can Siri tell me whether uh, I, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I can communicate very well? You know, the problem that I have is with Siri, not with me, right? So that's not going to be something that you, um, that you do anytime soon with a machine, but AI can help you save time in some situations, and we really, Think about it as artificial assistance. So how do I use AI to help me do things better in my job? Um, in the staffing area, um, some of the things that we think that are important uh, for machine learning, correlation. How do I understand the true drivers that lead to a placement? Everybody understands the general 
um, placement um, uh, uh, funnel, which is I've got a job order, how many job orders do I have, how many candidates, applicants do I have for that job, how many uh, submittals do I have for that job, how many interviews did I get for that job, how many did I j actually get a placement or not. Everybody kind of understands the macro level, but as Terry can tell you in a talk that he's doing a little bit later this week, when you look at the actual figures, it's all over the place. The number, the ratios, and the, and the actual uh, numbers that, that lead to that in the funnel are different for almost every industry, for every company, for every you know, permanent versus temporary versus executive placement. So correlation of the data, the real data, and not just your hunch, not just, to, oh, I've got a gut feel. This is, this is how it works. I've been in this industry for 20 years. I know how it works, right? You look at the actual data underneath it, nah, you're going to learn some things. It doesn't really work the way you think it does. Spotting win-loss in your open jobs. We've got a, a company, a customer in Ireland who's been really, really good at looking at a job and looking at the status of it after two days. And they've got enough, con they've got enough confidence now that they've identified the two or three things that are the tell for that job. We're going to win this job. With 85% confidence, we're going to win it, and they do. And it's because they've got enough data, and they've looked at enough patterns, and they've looked at enough uh, situations that they can tell you whether they're going to win the job or not. And why is that important? If, if the system comes back and says, hey, you've got a 10% chance of winning this, but you've got a 20, uh, you know, 75% chance of winning this one, which, which would you spend your time on? Right? You'd spend your time on the one that you've got a good chance of winning. So pattern recognition is really important. Trend analysis and forecasting. Um, you hear that commercial all the time in the, in the stock market that says past performance is not, a, not an indication of future you know, performance, right? Past, you can't look at the stock, how the stock market has done in the past so that you can project how it's done in the future, although that's what they're trying to do, right? And so one of the ways that we can use this is uh, I know for sure that your business is not a straight line. I'm going to go week by week by week by week to the end of the quarter, and we're going to just monotonically, in a linear fashion, hit my numbers throughout the quarter, right? It's always a hockey stick. You know, it's always some kind of a hockey stick, unless you're actually putting incentives on a weekly basis, and you're, and you're trying to control that and give people trying to smooth out that curve. But if I'm going to give you a projection of where you are in the middle of a quarter, you're at week seven of 13, and you're going to ask me, how am I doing against my quarterly goal? It's probably not going to be a linear projection to say, well, you're halfway through, Dave. So let's double that, and that's what you're going to have at the end of the quarter. It just don't work like that. So what we need to be able to do is go back into the data, look at it, and say, what does it really do? What do I really do on a regular basis? And where, where do I think I'm going to be based on the past performance that I've seen there? Natural language processing, everybody's familiar with CV parsing, extracting the information in the context, and job description parsing, the same thing. Um, what's interesting about these technologies is in, in, in a lot of ways they're not using natural language processing, they're, they're actually looking at the positioning of the data on a page. If, is it a header? You know, is it, how is it organized? Is it close to the, to, is it close to the name? Um, if, if this skill, if I recognize something as a skill, is it higher up on the page than it was another skill? You know? So there's positional things that are in there as well, but they do, they are able to extract entities and understand this is a company name, this is a, this is a title, this is a, a skill, um, this, is, this is a date and time range that I've worked there. Um, and then semantic search. And so um, Synonyms, everybody understands synonyms. It's what kind of equivalent meaning. How many people have heard of the terms hyponyms, meronyms, and holonyms before? No? Actually, uh, Google, Word got the, the first three, uh, but didn't know the, the, the final one, which basically uh, hypernyms is a, is a type of relationship. So um, a, uh, a Microsoft uh, a Word is a type of Microsoft Office product. Right, it's it's uh, it's that kind of a relationship. Meronym is a part of my hand is a part of my arm is a part of my body, and holonym is a container. So my body is a container for all of these different parts that are there, and we use those so easily in human thought that we don't even think about those anymore. But that's part of what goes into semantic searching is you have to understand 
the relationship of words to one another. Uh, and then building a natural language interface. And as I said, you need to think about it in, in when is it going to save me time and when is it the right way to do it. Um, is it easier to go into my uh, pharmacy on a phone and go through a tree and listen? Okay, listen, okay, no, number two, I need to reorder my prescription. All right, number two, right? Okay, if I want to do it by credit card and pick it up in the store, you know, you know, on and on and on, or what I rather say, I need to reorder a prescription, please, right? And it, that's direct, and it's and it's and it's good. It's like the the point and click interface that we're using is really good for a lot of things, but there's sometimes when a natural language interface is just better, especially when your hands are dirty and you're cooking. So. We've learned something. Terry and I have been working together. Um, we're, we're building out, if I hadn't mentioned it before, we're building out a goals and KPI management tool as a future product that we're going to be delivering sometime next year. And we, as part of that, we've gotten in touch with a lot of our customers and asked permission to analyze their data and look for some of this stuff. And so we've learned a couple of things in the last couple of months. We have a lot more to learn going forward. But there's a ton of information buried in the data you collect every day. If you're using a standard job science um, AMS and you move somebody from stage and substage to the next substage to the next stage and substage and you're moving them through, there are a lot of objects that are created within the Salesforce, the, the Salesforce database that represent the movement of that person through the application process. And as a result, We've got timing information and success information. This application, did it move to the next stage? No, this guy was rejected. Did this guy move to the next stage? Yes. How fast did he move? Was he, was he interviewed? Yes, he was submitted and then he was interviewed. How fast did that happen? So the actual results and timing of this information is really important and carries data for you that you can, if you, if you, know, how to, if you know what you're looking for, you can, you can extract it and use it. But data created by humans is not very reliable. Unfortunately, because uh, when I was a customer of Salesforce in the early 2000s, we called it feeding the data monster. Nobody wants to feed the data monster. You may need that data. I don't need that data, especially salespeople. Oh my God. You know, why do I need to fill that out? It's just Big Brother looking over my shoulder trying to figure out if I'm, if I, if I, what I'm doing. You know, it's like if you can give people value out of the data that they're putting in, then they're going to put it in. But if they're, not, if they're not getting direct data, direct value out of that data, they're not that interested in it. So human data is not really uh, reliable. If you say, yeah, I'm going to show you, I'm going to make all 25 fields on this page required. You know, that makes humans angry. And you will find malicious compliance. You will find email addresses that are rather rude. You know, you're going to find titles that are pretty convoluted, right? So if you, if you try to do that, it's not going to work. Now, you, could, you can do it the smart way, which is certain things are required along the way. And as you progress through, more and more things are required. That's not as easy to accomplish in Salesforce, quite honestly. Data required to earn a bonus is reliable but only two hours before the end of the quarter when the bonus calculation is going to be done, right? So I'm going to put it in there because, you know, the, the number one rule in the early days of Salesforce was if it's not in Salesforce, it doesn't exist. Okay, well, it will be in Salesforce at the very last moment, and I'll be able to get And how can I get timing information out of that? You can't, right? You need the timing information is just as important as the, day, as the other data. And so we know that data created by automated processes is very reliable and the timing of the creation of that data is critical. So what is the velocity through the process, not just the success factors? So what do we hope to accomplish with our goal manager and KPI? This is really not being, this is really, we're not really trying to do this as an advertisement for futures right here, but what do we, what do we learn out of this? Well, we want to unlock the information that's buried in your existing data. There is a lot of data that's being created, and we want to be able to measure performance based on the work that's already happening. If we are successful, we can basically sit there and make sure that the data is automatically created as you do your job, just as a byproduct of you doing your job. You're focused, remember, artificial assistance. You're doing your job, you're talking to people, you're making the phone calls, you're doing your work, and 
as you progress through the system, the data is, is these trails of breadcrumbs that are left for the machine to come back and say, okay, here's what your velocity curve looks like. Here's what your velocity looks like when you win a deal. And here's what the velocity looks like when you're going to lose it. Real-time visibility. Um, if I don't have, if, how can I know where I'm at in the middle? If I have to wait at the end of the quarter for a report to tell me how well I did on my goals, <laughs> that doesn't do, do me any good. I need an opportunity to do something about it. Give me a forecast my results while there's still time for me to do something about it, right? So that's really key. And so projecting the results based to the period to the date and the past tendencies is really important. Use that AI to go back and say, what does my quarter look like in general? And what does my trajectory look like? And based on past performance, am I going to hit it now? Or what do I need to do if I can't hit it? Uh, simplify the planning process. We've heard over and over again from talking to people, we have a goals tool, but the biggest pain is we have to put a spreadsheet together and put all the goals in the spreadsheet and then try to figure out all the past performances. We do these reports and we take some of these reports and we put in the data and we look at these other reports and then we got to figure out, okay, this guy's been here more than a year now, so he should have higher. So planning and, and attributing these goals is really, really hard. Um, and then experts assistance. So, so um, if I'm in the middle of my quarter and I'm, I'm you know, I'm at 20% I'm at of my goal, um, why? Uh, well, we, we can look at the number of job orders. You have enough to open job orders. So it's not that you lack job orders. You have enough work to do. Um, but three of these guys don't have enough candidates. You haven't sourced enough people for these three jobs. These other two jobs, you've got plenty of candidates. You haven't submitted any to the, to the client. You kind of got to submit them before they're going to grant an interview, right? So if, if we could actually automate the process and instead of saying, um, you know, instead of coming up with some, uh, some, rant, some uh, s silly suggestion of, you know, do a better job or something, look back at the actual data and on a case-by-case on a -case basis tell you how you need, to, for each of these open jobs that you've got, what do you need to do for each one of those to drive it forward? And, and by the way, which one should you focus on? Because you're not going to win this one, we, we, we're pretty sure. Now, it needs to be advice because until you gain the trust of the system, as I said, it can't be a black box. It has to be explainable. You know, if I can explain to you why you're not going to win this deal, you know, maybe this is one of your this is one of your customers that you always give them, you know, 10 submissions, you always get two interviews and you never win the deal. And it happens over and over and over and over again. We can recognize that and say, hey, guy, you, you, I know you've got hope, but you're not going to win this one because past performance says you're not. So what's the best way to get back on track? Where do I take my time? I've got limited amount of time and energy. How do I focus my time and energy to do the right thing? The other thing that we're, that we're doing in this and uh, we're looking for feedback on this is that people think about their businesses in different ways. First of all, everybody's business is different. Some people are you know, in, in a region like the Bay Area and they only, solve the, they only serve the Bay Area and they only serve IT. And some people are multinational in large numbers and they're in different vertical markets and they're in different, they have different, they have temp and perm and, and, uh, and, and executive placement. So um, being able to, to describe your business in dimensions that make sense. So I have my branch offices, I have my business units, my line of business, my geography, uh, North America, EMEA, APAC, or is it North America only, so now I'm interested in East Coast, West Coast, and Central, or uh, NorCal and so SoCal, because I'm only in California and I have offices in North and the South, and that's all I really care about. And then ad hoc teams, because almost every time you come up with some nice structure to put together your business, you're going to have, well, I've got that one team, and it kind of crosses lines and it crosses, and so can I just put together this team of people and give them a goal? And then, of course, your employees. And so the idea here is that you can dis describe your business and give, you, give your business goals at each of these levels. I'm going to give my branch offices at San Jose and San Francisco and Denver and London. I'm going to give them a goal. Now, what are the employees that work in these offices? And if I roll up the employees' goals, if the employees did everything that I'm asking them to do, but yet the goal for the San Francisco office was twice what the employees' goals were, that's not a good goal, right? 
you need to give either give them more uh, goals, uh, give them more uh, quota, or you need to take the San Francisco number down because it's just not realistic. So how do you give somebody the ability to not only define these things, but to roll them up and look at them and, and say, these are doing, these are, these are correct, they're self-sufficient, they're self-contained and, 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 and agree with each other, the goals make sense. That, that uh, if my employees in the um, healthcare business unit better have 120% of what I'm trying to get in the healthcare unit because they're not gonna make their goals. So I wanna make sure that if, they, if, if em enough employees fail that I'm down at 100%, I still make my goal as a manager for that healthcare business unit, right? So um, as we look forward to the next year, um, we ask ourselves the question, okay, we, we understand the hype about AI, we understand that it re it's really about assisting you so that you can do your job better and, and make the performance better, but um, what, ca what can we do as practical magic, right? So this stuff that, that uh, Engelbart showed back in 68, that was magic. That was real magic. People going, oh my God, how do you do that, right? Well, this is practical magic. This is taking, this is where it, uh, research becomes engineering. This is where you take the tools that are out there and available and apply them towards uh, a goal. And, and what are those goals? So in semantic search, um, I need to give you a title. I'm gonna give you a title, but the title just needs to be close. Because I know that you're gonna take that title and you're gonna give me similar titles and you're gonna look at the industry and look at the variants and you're gonna know what I mean don't, don't match exactly on JavaScript developer. God, you know, it's, you know what a JavaScript developer is. Match on, you know, front-end designer, right? Because it's, it's, it's not about matching text anymore. Um, matching a CV to a job ad advertising, you can, take, um, you can take the CV and you can extract the data out of it, and you can take the job and extract the data out of it and match those two things together. But there are techniques, uh, Bayesian analysis and some others, where you can take the text of these two things and munge them together and, and get a score that says that this job advert and this CV actually match one another. And you haven't actually done the extraction. So there's multiple ways of doing that. And then um, identify the stars without losing the rank and file. One of the things we heard, it was so funny, Ted did this TED talk and we were talking about, we're gonna, we're gonna come up with a job ranking system, a job scoring system uh, so when a candidate goes on your job board and they, they make an application, we're going to take your job advertisement, we're going to take that candidate, we're going to score them together, and we're going to tell you who you should talk to and who you shouldn't. Even to the point where we can automatically schedule them a, job, a phone screen and just tell the other guys, no thanks, Charlie. Oh my God, there was, a, there was a, an eruption. No, no, we talk to everyone. This is, a, this is an applicant. This, he may be fit for something else. Don't, don't tell them no. You know, tell them we'll talk to them about something else, but don't tell them no. So, and I don't trust your system. Are you telling me the machine is gonna decide whether this person gets an interview or not? Give me a break, right? What we think is gonna happen is that if it's open enough and it's transparent enough, do you, and, and you start looking at the top candidates as we rank them on the screen, and you find that, you know what, this, these top candidates are pretty good. They match pretty well. And, I, and those are the guys that get placed on an ongoing basis. How many people do a Google search and look at page three of the results? You know, nobody, right? That first page has got the right people in there. So we ought to be able to give you candidate scoring that gives you the right candidates on that first page. I shouldn't have to look at a thousand of them to find the right ones. So auto scoring enhancements, um, the biggest challenge we've had you know, the human humans entering data is not reliable. You know, rule number one. Um, we found the job parser, uh, the, uh, the, the actual job uh, matching technology that we built, we relied on you actually putting in a, uh, a list of features and attributes that somebody looking for. No, that's too much. I don't want to actually tell you what I'm looking at in a structured way. So we need to be able to give you, give me the advertisement, because I know that you have an advertisement for every job out there, right? You put it on the job board, just give it to me and we'll extract the information and we'll match based on that. And suggested skills. You may have asked for these skills, but you know what? We've got a partner that tells us that for this job, for thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of advertisements out there, here are the skills for this title that most people are asking for. So maybe you want to include some of these other ones. Maybe not, but you know, suggest those for you. 
and then the KPI, build the KPI and goal tracking, um, and do industry comparisons because um, we want to be able to not only have you look and have consistency in the goals that you're making for individual offices and, and lines of business, but we want to, to see if, you, if you're tracking against your competitors. So we want to set it up so that, that people opt into this, but you're able to say, how am I doing based on other people that are in the healthcare temporary placement industry, right, in, the, in North America? And are, they, are we achieving the same number of placements, the same velocity and everything else as them? Um, engagement tracking. This is something that, that Ted is preaching and, and, I, and I totally get, which is you, you may have a database of, of a million resumes, but how many of those actually have valid email addresses? And can you actually talk to if you had something, if they were a great match, would you rather find them in your database and find out you don't know how to talk to them because their phone number and their email address is trash, right? So you need to understand engagement. And, and it, it costs a lot of money to acquire these candidates. You make, make sure that you, you, you're consistently engaging with them and that, you've, that you know that they're reachable and that you know that when I send them something, they're actually going to answer. And not only are they going to answer, they're going to answer at 10 o'clock in the morning when they take their coffee break. Right, because they do every time. Every time I send them something, they answer at 10 o'clock in the morning. So when do you want to send them something? 9.55. Email them at 9.55 so it'll be on the top of their box. Right? So there are techniques from the cam marketing campaigns that really should, can be used and should be used in engaging with people that are in your candidate database and your client database so that you're talking to them the right way and score them. So, you know, who are the people that if I'm sending something to them, I'm likely to get a response so that I know. And then in the workforce management side of things, just-in-time talent. How do I get the right people in the right job, you know, is, is when I need them and, and uh, at the last moment, which is a, a little bit difficult. I've got substitute teach. I've got a teacher that calls in and says, I can't make it today. You know, how do I, how do I get a substitute teacher to fill that slot? Uh, with the right skills, who lives within the right distance of commute time, et cetera, et cetera. How do I maximize my utilization and profits? If I've got five candidates that I can put into a job, which candidate gives me the best profit? And which candidate, maybe I have a, a, a deal with this candidate, this, this uh, uh, employee, that he needs to be working 80% of the time. So how, if I've got a choice of who I can place, how do I make sure that I either maximize utilization, my profit, or maybe I've got a customer and this customer is not very happy with me, right? So I wanna, I wanna do him a, a solid favor and I'm gonna give him the better candidates for the next six months or the next six weeks so that I can get back into his favor. So there are decisions that need to be made from a human perspective. So how do we give you the tools that you know how you can maximize? Hey, if you want to make your customer happy, give them this guy. But if you want to maximize your utilization, give this guy. And if you want to maximize your profit, give me this guy. Right? Because those are the choices you have to deal with. Um, Ted and I, we, we, we had this conversation around just there's too much information out there. There's so much information out there. Um, and, and what I... The, the story came about because I was talking to Ted about a book I'm writing on the Persian um, Iran in 1915 during World War I. Uh, that's, my, that's what I do to relax and get, out of, get my head out of technology as I, I write historical fiction. So um, I was telling Ted, you could get a master's degree today in any subject. I wrote a book in 2000 which was on Chinese hackers. You know, and I could, I could get online in 2000 and I could find most everything that I needed. And if I couldn't, it was in a library somewhere. Today, I, I've learned so much about the Iranian Constitutional Revolution in 1906 and the kind of things that are available online. It's just a wealth of information. If you wanted to become an expert in any topic today, you can. You can do that for free. You don't need to go to Stanford. Right? You can find out anything you want to do. If the purpose is you want to actually understand it, but you've got to be directed in your pursuits. Because if you're not directed, you're going to go off into all kinds of tangent, which is the next line, don't chase squirrels. How many people know the movie Up? The dog in the movie Up? Squirrel! Well, that's our favorite phrase for Ted. Ted's like, squirrel! <laughs> squirrel! <laughs> so we told Ted in a management meeting one time, okay, Ted, no more squirrels. 
no more squirrels. We're not chasing squirrels. Um, but if you can and you have access to them, you can ask an expert and they'll direct you. Now, why did I bring this up? Because the same thing is true in, in your business, that if there, there's a lot of information out there. You can, especially on Salesforce, there's the trailheads are amazing. There's all kinds of information on how to actually make the, the what you can do with a system, but you've got to be directed. You can't go off chasing squirrels. And a lot of times it helps if you just ask an expert first and we can direct you in the right in the right direction. So what does this all mean? Um, to wrap it up, the commuting technologies finally caught up with the vision from 50 years ago, this both in AI as, as well as um, in, in the, the other communications technology. Um, how many people know what Metcalfe's law is? You know what Moore's law is, right? You know, techno, chips, chips uh, are, are, every 18 months a chip is either twice as, half as big or cost half as much. Or you could do the same amount of computing with half as much money in the same, in the same size. Metcalfe's law was um, Bob Metcalf, who founded um, a networking company, an Ethernet company. And um, fax machine, everybody knows what a fax machine does, right? I sell the first fax machine out there. How much is that worth? Worth nothing. If I have a fax machine and there's nobody else in the world that has a fax machine, I, I can't do anything with it, right? So every, the cool thing about Metcalf's law, what he recognized was every additional person that bought a fax machine even though they're buying a new fax machine, they're buying their fax machine, it adds value to yours. Because I can now actually fax it to many, many more people, right? So what's happened is, it's not just Moore's Law, but it's Facebook. Facebook is a great example of this. You know, a billion people or more in the same network, that's where the value of Facebook is. You, have, you can't reproduce it anymore, but you, know, you couldn't compete with it because they've already got a billion people in that network. And so the value of one additional person gains all that value when they join. So what's happening in the AI er area is that Moore's Law and Metcalf's Law has driven the high-tech fantasy into every everyday con consumer experience. And so um, when you think about AI, it's really about practical magic. It's really about figuring out how we can use these cool, scientific, esoteric, uh, academic kind of kind of techniques and technology practically applied to the problems that you have so that you can have more time and, and be more productive and, and just enjoy your job better and have people talking to people and have the machine do the rest of the hard work.